Historians have reinterpreted Civil War Reconstruction over the last 50 years. Shortly before the centennial, it was commonly believed that the chief aim of the Republican-dominated Congress was to ensure lasting party control of the federal government by creating a reliable voting bloc in the South, for which improved racial status among blacks was a coupled but secondary objective. By the sesquicentennial, however, it had become the accepted view among historians that the Republican desire for racial equality was untainted by anything more than negligible self-interest. Consequently, the presently dominant race-centric focus of Reconstruction minimizes factors that affected Southerners regardless of race. Contrary to popular belief, Southern poverty has been a longer-lasting Civil War legacy than has segregation. Prior to the war, the South had a bimodal wealth distribution with concentrations at the poles. The classic planters with 50 or more slaves had prosperous estates, but they represented only about 1% of Southern families, partly because 1860 slave property values represented half of the Southern wealth, seven of the 10 states with the highest per capita wealth joined the Confederacy. But since 70% of Confederate families did not own slaves, the South's per capita income was about 28% below the national average, according to William Cooper in his book on the uh, history of the South. Uh, A century later, Eight of the 10 states with the lowest per capita incomes were former rebel states. The depths of post-Civil War War Southern poverty and its duration were far greater and longer and more multiracial than commonly supposed. It took 85 years, according to this chart, until 1950 for the South's per capita income to regain its below average percentile ranking it it held in 1860. The war had destroyed two thirds of Southern railroads and livestock. Excluding the total loss in the value of slaves resulting from emancipation, assessed real estate property values in 1870 were less than half of those of 1860. About 300,000 white Southern males in the prime of adulthood died during the war, and perhaps another 200,000 were incapacitated, representing almost 20% of the region's 2.8 million uh, adult males of all ages. During the war, Southern farms had drifted back to nature. Returning Confederate soldiers often found that their families were starving. Historian David L. Cohn puts it this way, When there was a shortage of work stock, the few surviving animals were passed from neighbor to neighbor. When there was no work stock, the men hitched themselves to the plow. By by ingenuity, backbreaking toil, and cruel self-denial, thousands of uh, southern farmers survived Reconstruction. They received no aid from any source, nor any sympathy outside the region. By 1870, Southern bank capital totaled only $17 million as compared to $61 million 10 years earlier in 1860. National policies largely ignored post-war Southern poverty until President Franklin Roosevelt commissioned a report in 1938, 73 years after the war had ended. The study disclosed that the South remained America's poorest region. Its 1937 per capita income of $300 was only half of that of the $600 for the rest of the country. Shortly after the Great Depression began, the president of General Motors, Alfred P. Sloan, voluntarily cut his annual salary from $500,000 to $340,000. His $160,000 cut was more than all of the income taxes paid by two million Mississippi residents that year. During the last year of the prosperous, roaring 1920s, Southern farmers earned an average of $190, which was only about one-third 
of the 530 average for other American farmers. As a result, there was often little money left over for food and clothing, and none for otherwise common articles such as books and radios. Even as late as the 1930s, more than half of Southern farmers depended upon cotton alone. Yet price fluctuations in the world cotton markets were a sheer gamble. Only once during the 10 years between 1927 and 1937 did the price change less than 10% annually. Composing more than half of all Southern farmers, tenants and sharecroppers were at the bottom of the heap. Many lived like the Russian serfs of the 19th century. Sharecropper per, per capita incomes averaged $63 annually, which equated to 17 cents per day. By comparison, during the depression that followed the 1873 financial panic 65 years earlier, the Ohio Department of Labor estimated the poverty line at a dollar a day. Perhaps most surprising to present-day audiences, Roosevelt's report disclosed that whites composed half of all sharecroppers and that they lived under, quote, economic conditions almost identical with those of Negro sharecroppers, close quote. Since cotton was the cornerstone of the South's economy, nearly all residents shared the farmers' hazards to some extent. Financing the farmers, for example, was more costly than elsewhere because of the greater risk of failure. Poverty bred poor health. Ailments such as pellagra, rickets, and hookworm that were almost unknown in other parts of the country plagued the South for almost a century after the Civil War. All could have been prevented by cheap dietary changes, better sanitation, and the use of shoes. So short was the life expectancy in South Carolina, this state, that half of the state's population was under the age of 20 as late as 1930. Of the 3 million farms surveyed uh, in 1930, only 6% had piped in water. More than half were unpainted. Only about one-third had screens. Post-war politics and federal economic policies contributed to the South's long-delayed economic recovery. Among such factors were property confiscations, Republican Party self-interest, discriminatory federal budgets, protective tariffs, union veterans' pensions, banking regulations, discriminatory freight rates, lax monopoly regulation, absentee ownership, and the requirement that America's poorest states pay for the public education of ex-slaves, even though emancipation was a national, not regional policy. When Lee sur surrendered to Grant, more than two million fungible cotton bales lay scattered across the South, as compared to a trifling $15 million in U.S. currency then circulating in the region. But instead of priming the pump of Southern economic recovery, the cotton was plundered. Union soldiers, U.S. Treasury officials, and Northern businessmen stole most of it. A dismayed U.S. Treasury Secretary Hugh McCullough remarked, quote, I am sure that I sent some honest cotton agents south, but it sometimes seems very doubtful that any of them remained honest for very long. When the Civil War ended, the Republican Party was barely 10 years old. Its leaders worried that it might be strangled in its cradle if the readmittance of the southern states into the Union failed to be managed in a way that would prevent Southerners from allying with Northern Democrats to regain control of the federal government. If all former Confederate states were admitted to the 39th Congress in December 1865, and each added member was a Democrat, the Republicans would lose their veto-proof two-thirds majority in Congress. Thus, the infant GOP needed to ensure that most of the new Southern senators and congressmen be Republicans. That meant that vassal governments had to be formed in the southern states. Since there were few white Republicans in the region, the party needed to create a new constituency. Consequently, Republicans settled on two goals, 
First was mandatory African American suffrage for all in all former Confederate states. The party correctly expected that such a mostly inexperienced electorate could be manipulated to consistently support Republican interests out of gratitude. Second was to deny political power to Southern white classes most likely to oppose Republican policies. Although it is often assumed that the Republicans party sponsorship of Southern black suffrage was motivated by a moral impulse to promote racial equality, the bulk of the evidence suggests the party was more interested in retaining political power. First, the 1866 Civil Rights Act declared nearly all blacks to be citizens, but expressly denied citizenship to Indians unless they paid taxes. Moreover, Chinese Americans were also pragmatically excluded and would not even get the right to become naturalized citizens until 1943 when they had soldiers in the U.S. Army. Thus, the act only uh, thus, the act focused only on the solitary racial minority that was expected to be reliably Republican, to wit, ex-slaves. Second, Republicans recognized that many Northerners opposed black suffrage in their own states. At the end of the war, only five New England states with tiny black populations of less than 1% permitted blacks to vote. Connecticut, Minnesota, and Wisconsin rejected black suffrage in 1865. Kansas did so in 1867, as did Michigan and Missouri in 1868. And New York declined to repeal property requirements for black voters in 1869. Third, a month after General Lee's surrender, Union Major General William T. Sherman wrote a colleague, quote, I have never heard a Negro ask for voting rights and I think it would be his ruin. I believe the whole idea of giving votes to the Negroes is to create just that many votes to be used by others for political purposes. Fourth, after the collapse of the carpetbag regimes in 1877, the Republican Party virtually ignored the Southern blacks. As a result of their post-war lust for lasting political power, the Republicans proceeded with a plan for universal black suffrage in the South, if not the North. They adopted three 1867 congressional acts and passed them over Andrew Johnson's vetoes. The acts imposed four requirements on the South. First, except for Tennessee, the remaining 10 states of the former Confederacy were divided into five military districts and governed by martial law. Tennessee was exempted because she already had a Republican-controlled government. Second, that's where Andrew Johnson came from. Second, each of the ten was to organize conventions to adopt new constitutions, satisfactory to the Republican Congress. In order to optimize Republican favor results, for the election of the convention delegates, occupation soldiers, union occupation soldiers, federal occupation soldiers were authorized to supervise voter registrations. Third, the states were required to let black males vote for convention delegates and simultaneously deny office holding privileges to many former Confederates and also deny the vote to many former Confederates. Fourth, each state constitution was to require universal black male suffrage, although they were permitted to restrict white suffrage. Moreover, the legislatures of the newly formed governments might additionally uh, restrict white suffrage. If not in the constitution, then the legislatures that were elected could do so. Although they overrode his objections, President Johnson's veto message cast doubt on the constitutionality of the 1867 Reconstruction Acts, as well as the 1866 Civil Rights Act. Ever since the 1791 Tenth Amendment, voter qualifications had been universally regarded as a state's right. 
1868, therefore, the Republicans resolved to amend the U.S. Constitution. The result was the 14th Amendment, which had two key provisions. First, persons born in the United States would be American citizens and citizens of their resident state. No race could be excluded except non-taxpaying Indians. Asian Americans, however, were also effectively excluded by gender-specific immigration restrictions. Specifically, few females were allowed to enter the country for birthing babies, for birthing Chinese American babies, that would entitle the Chinese uh, offspring to have birthright citizenship. 96% of the Chinese Americans were male. They wouldn't let any female uh, Chinese come in, and they had uh, outlawed interracial marriage in California. Second, states refusing suffrage to male citizens of any qualified race would have their congressional representation cut by subtracting the number of members of the excluded race from the applicable state's population for purposes of calculating House representation and electoral votes. Due to their tiny black populations, the provision was inconsequential in the North. No elected representative from the former Confederate states could be seated in Congress until his state adopted the 14th Amendment and Congress, the Republican-controlled Congress, approved the pertinent state's constitution. Until then, southern states had no legal authority, and they were militarily ruled, martial law. Secretary of State Seward, William Seward, ratified the 14th Amendment in July 1868 by declaring that 28 of the 36 states had approved it, even though two of the 28, Ohio and New Jersey, had rescinded their ratifications. As a result, the 1868 Republican presidential candidate, Ulysses Grant, won 450,000 black Southern votes, without which he would have lost the popular vote although he would have retained a majority of the electoral votes. So here he was, a war hero. He got less than half of the white votes when he was elected president in 1868. The, the, the southern states that did vote to approve the uh, 14th Amendment were all basically in control of carpetbaggers and scallywags. Since six of the readmitted eight southern states voted for Grant in 1868, and only two voted against him, it was apparent that a second amendment granting black men the, right, the vote in every state could be quickly approved. The resulting 15th Amendment was ratified in 1870. During Reconstruction, Southerners were required to pay their share of federal taxes for sizable budget items that if paid by an independent defeated foe would have been reparations. There's a lot of talk now about reparations, but the Southerners, the former Confederates specifically, have already paid reparations, as I will show. Although reparations are a common form of victor's compensation, nobody should assume the Southern states escaped the equivalent penalties merely because they were readmitted to the Union. Take a look at that table. The accompanying table summarizes federal tax revenues and spending for a quarter of a century after the Civil War. More than half of federal tax revenues applied to three items. Interest on the federal debt, one. Two, budget surpluses, which were used to retire the federal debt. And back in those days, they did. And three, Union veterans' pensions, more than half the federal budget. Although compelled to pay their share of these taxes required to fund those items, former Confederates derived no benefit whatsoever from them. The budget surpluses repaid the federal war debts, which had jumped 40-fold during the Civil War, from $65 million to $2.7 billion. This was in the form of bonds sold in the North to Union citizens and the banks. Southerners did not hold any of these bonds. 
Some were held by the national banks, which bought them as monetary reserves as mandated by the 1863 National Banking Act, but many Northern civilians also owned the bonds. Bond policies also penalized Southerners in another way. Specifically, in 1869, the first law that President Grant signed was to require that the bonds be repaid in gold, even though they were purchased with paper money, which traded at a fluctuating discount to gold. As in July 1864, the paper, the paper greenback was worth 35 cents. So if you you could have you know you could have gained 65 over 35 would have been your percentage gain. All of these bonds had to be repaid in gold. Since the bonds and interest had to be repaid in gold, the value of the paper money required to make such payments was larger than the face amount of the bonds and their associated interest coupons. The difference was an extra cost to the taxpayer, but a bonus to the northern bondholder. Protective tariffs caused the budget surpluses that generated more income than needed to operate the federal government. As compared to less than 20 percent, in fact 19 percent before the war, dutiable items were taxed at about 45 percent until Democrat Woodrow Wilson became president in 1913. It's interesting when you talk about the causes of the war and you mention tariffs and the, the northern historians will argue, well, that was completely secondary to slavery. But look what the winning side did. The winning side took tariffs from 19% to 45% and kept them there for 50 years. I don't see how we can deny that was an aim of the, of the union, uh, of, of the federal politicians or the northerners. They were increased after Woodrow Wilson was left the White House. They were increased again in the 1920s after Republicans had gained control of the White House during the Roaring Twenties. Rates generally remained high until after World War II when the manufacturing economies of the states north of the Ohio and Potomac rivers had no international competitors because World War II had destroyed the economies of Europe and Asia. Only then, once the states north of the Potomac and Ohio rivers had no competition from overseas manufacturers, then all of a sudden they want low tariffs. And that's kind of the policy that's been adopted until the current president. Protective tariffs harmed the South's economy. Even as late as the 1930s, the region sold 60% of its cotton overseas. But foreign buyers could not pay for Southern cotton unless they could generate the exchange credits needed by selling manufactured goods to Americans. But protective tariffs blocked that, or at least impeded that. By one estimate, the post-Civil War tariffs imposed an implicit 11% tax on agricultural exports. As Cornell professor Richard Bensel puts it, the tariff redistributed wealth from the periphery to the northern industrial regions in the form of higher prices for manufactured goods, and from the periphery to the national treasury in the form of customs duties. Finally, former Confederates derived no benefit from liberal federal spending on Union veterans' pensions. Such pensions were originally paid only to soldiers who had received disabling injuries during military service, but Republicans gradually expanded eligibility for the purpose of solidifying the veterans as one of the party's chief voter constituencies. By 1904, any union, veterans, any union veteran over the age of 62 was regarded as disabled thereby transforming the program into an old age retirement system instead of a, a compensation system for injuries. In 1893, Union veterans' pensions accounted over for, for more than 40 percent of the entire federal budget, that one single item. Annual disbursements for Union veterans' pensions did not peak until 1921 which was 56 years after the war had ended. The last payment was made in 2016. 
While some federal spending not specified in the preceding table did benefit the South, they were few, tiny, or funded by Southerners themselves. From 1865 to 1873, the federal government spent $103 million on public works, but less than 10% of it went to the Confederate States, the former Confederate States. Additionally, the federal government taxed cotton. As prices dropped after the war, the levy represented about 20% of the selling price of the cotton. It raised $68 million which was about seven times the amount of public work spending in the South from 1865 to 1873. The tax could not be passed along to the buyer because most of the cotton was sold overseas, where on the London markets they could buy cotton from other countries that did not have the tax. So there was no way to pass that tax along to the buyers. While the Freedmen's Bureau provided some economic assistance for the Southerners, it was mostly devoted to ex-slaves. Moreover, the cotton tax alone accounted for more than paid for all of the federal spending on the Freedmen's Bureau during the Bureau's entire existence. To clarify how post-Civil War bank regulations retarded Southern economic recovery, it should be understood that the U.S. Constitution only granted the federal government the authority to coin money, not to print fiat currency. Due to the collapse of the earlier continental dollar, this was no mere oversight. Nonetheless, the enormous federal financing required by the Civil War compelled monetary changes. The first was the 1862 Legal Tender Act, which paved the way for the 1863 National Banking Act. The first act authorized the federal government to print money without gold backing and the second forced the national banks to become regular buyers of federal bonds, which were used to finance the war. This practice continues today. The banks used to need gold as their reserve, but this 1863 National Banking Act said, no, you don't have to have gold as a reserve, you can just have government bonds. Well, that had the immediate effect of giving the incentive to the banks to buy bonds because gold doesn't pay interest where bonds do. We're still living with the consequences of that. Congress drove the independent banks, the non-national banks, out of the market by putting a 10% tax on their banknotes. Although the post-Civil War South badly needed rebuilding capital, it was almost impossible for Southerners to organize suitable banks, especially national banks. First, national bank requirements were beyond the means of the poor Southerners. Second, national banks generally could not make mortgage loans, a loan type essential to the agrarian South. Third, national banks were restricted to a single branch, which was a handicap in the sparsely populated South. Fourth, even though state chartered banks might offer mortgages and or require less startup capital, the 10% federal tax on their banknotes burdened them with prohibitive operating costs. Fifth, regulatory limitations on the total value of banknotes in circulation throughout the country made it hard to gain authority to open new banks, thereby leaving banking concentrated in the Northeast. Northern railroads steadily increased their ownership of Southern operators for decades after the war due to, southern to the Southern capital shortage. Once under Northern control, the railroads quickly be began using discriminatory freight rate differentials to block Southern competition to principal Northern shippers, such as the steelmakers. When asked in 1890 why shipping rates into the North for Southern iron products were higher, one Pennsylvania Railroad agent replied, quote, it was done at the request of the Pennsylvania Iron Men, close quote. Yet due to its wealth and industrial concentration, the region north of the Ohio and Potomac Rivers was a key market. All domestic manufacturers needed to access that market if they were to compete on a national scale. As a means of impeding competition from southern and western manufacturers, the discriminatory freight rates were as effective as protective tariff between the states, which were constitutionally prohibited. Interstate railroad 
freight practices were not subject to federal review until the Interstate Commerce Commission was formed in 1887. Almost from the beginning, however, the ICC sanctioned discriminatory rates. No careful study was made until 1939, when rates for the same service in the South were found to be 40% higher than in the North for 14 selected items. The differentials were so discriminatory that remote northern manufacturers could ship finished goods into the South at lower cost than southern makers of the same items could distribute them within their own region. Finally, the 1940 Transportation Act required the ICC to investigate and eliminate geographic discriminatory rates. After four years, in June 1944, the ICC ordered rates in the North be increased by 10 percent and those in the South and West be decreased by 10 percent. Southern, host uh, Southern hostility towards protective tariffs was also in direct opposition to monopolies because such tariffs were a prime cause of monopolies. The first res federal response to monopolies was the 1890 Sherman Antitrust Act. Unfortunately, the act targeted only the apparatus of monopoly instead of the cause. Nine years later, the president of the New York-based American Sugar Refining Company which controlled 98% of the market through its still famous Domino brand, admitted in testimony to an industrial commission, quote, the mother of all trust is the customs tariff bill. Production economies of scale in the same line of business are a great incentive to trust formation, but these bear a very insignificant proportion to the advantages granted in the way of protection under the customs tariff. It is the government, through the tariff laws, which plunders the people and the trust, are, nearly, are merely the machinery for doing it. Tariffs breed monopolies like swamps bred mosquitoes. The era's biggest United States steel was deliberately formed to suppress competition. Even though steel could be produced more cheaply in America than in other countries, U.S. Steel sold products overseas at lower prices than they did domestically. Wire nails, for example, were sold domestically for $2 per hundredweight, but they were priced at $1.55 in Britain, even with the added transportation costs. When Andrew Carnegie toured the emerging southern steel industry centered in Birmingham in 1889, he declared, quote, the South is Pennsylvania's most formidable industrial enemy, close quote. About 10 years later, Carnegie's mills were merged into Pittsburgh-based U.S. Steel. Six years later, U.S. Steel bought the biggest southern mills and imposed discriminatory pricing on southern production. Thereafter, steel from the company's Alabama mills included an incremental markup termed, quote, the Birmingham differential, close quote, of $3 per ton over the Pittsburgh quote. To further penalize Alabama production, buyers of Birmingham steel were required to pay freight from Birmingham plus a phantom charge as if the shipments originated in Pittsburgh. After Woodrow Wilson became president, a Federal Trade Commission investigation concluded that Birmingham steel production costs were the lowest in the country and 26% below those of Pittsburgh. Yet U.S. steel continued to require a $3 per ton Birmingham differential, which was raised to $5 a ton in 1920. Six months after the differential was finally abolished in 1939, Shipbuilding plants in Pascagoula, Mississippi, and Mobile, Alabama announced major expansions. President Roosevelt's 1938 study revealed that absentee ownership remained a problem and included such essential industries as electric utilities, railroads, steel manufacturing, and even cotton textile mills. Outsiders also controlled most of the area's natural resources such as coal, feldspar, iron ore, zinc, sulfur, and bauxite. Northerners reserved for themselves the more prosperous work of converting the raw materials into finished goods. About 90% of the 4.5 million blacks at the end of the Civil War were living in the former Confederate states. The great majority were illiterate and needing public education. Although 
The federally financed Freedmen Bureau spent over $5 million for black schools after the Civil War. Southerners basically paid for the schools through the cotton tax noted earlier. After Congress discontinued the Bureau in 1870, the former rebel states had to rely upon their own meager tax resources to pay for educating all of their pupils, including the 40% who were black. In sum, while Reconstruction history should include a thorough analysis of undeniable racism and its protracted effects, contemporary historians should also devote comparable attention to the numerous equally important non-racial and political factors. And that's my point, and that's my talk. Thank you.